Well, uh, hello everybody, and at least according to our account, we're on the 34th day. We realize there are different starting times on this, but uh, according to our account, we're on the 34th day. And of course, if you uh, start on a Sunday, which is what we're assuming, you're always going to wind up on a multiple of seven on the weekly Sabbath. There's a lot of discussions on this whole topic and a lot of different opinions, and it's not my place to try to nail this down, but I'm trying to look at the things that really are not debatable and are fr frankly very inspiring. So you see what, what I've got here is really what begins this whole topic of counting is right in this topic of counting uh, it begins in a handful of verses with what's commonly called the wave offering. And you can go to the next slide. So if you take a look at Leviticus 23, a, a chapter we're very, very familiar with, of course, this wave offering is described here uh, beneath these qualifiers. Leviticus 23, 4 says these are in the King James, it calls them feasts of the Lord. The actual word there is a moad. Plural would be moadim, I understand. But most of us are very familiar with it. It's an appointed time, an appointed theme, an appointed place. And it's interesting, these moad or moadim were actually established in Genesis 1 and verse 14 on the fourth day of creation really quite impressive, but it's, it's interesting. So this is the header and presumably what we're reading applies to everything beneath it. So with that premise, you can go to the next slide. So if you take a look again in that same verse, if you look at the word holy, most of us are very familiar with it. Uh, apart, holiness, sacred, to consecrate, to sanctify, to dedicate, to be honoring, to be treated as sacred. And again, I would have to assume everything beneath here, all of these points are considered holy. Now, it's not commonly looked at the wave offering as a holy event. Evidently it is, according to this, and it is an appointed one. You want to go to the next slide, please. The word convocation there is something that, uh, of course, means a reading or a calling together. We still use those kind of terms, but it's interesting. It defines all of the appointed times as holy and a time to come together and read it and or come together. And then let's go to the next slide. We're just kind of stepping through and expanding on it. All of these events should be proclaimed or recited. There should be an invitation. There should be a commemoration of all of the events that are listed below. I thought this is really quite interesting. You want to go to the next slide. And they are to be proclaimed in their seasons. Oh, we've got the same word being used again. <clears throat> the Moad, they are to be proclaimed at their appointed time. Not only are they appointed times, have an appointed theme. And it, of course, originally they were in an appointed place, but they are to be proclaimed or announced in their, in their season. Now, most of us, of course, have long since passed that season, sometimes more than a month away, some a handful of weeks away. But it's interesting that uh, God tells us that we're supposed to commemorate these events. We are to make note of them. We are to announce them. Next slide, please. Now, I've skipped down just a couple of verses. As you know, those verses in front of this will address the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in the midst of that week, presumably, Leviticus 23.10 applies. This was given to them, of course, before they were in the land. So when you come into the land, 
reap the harvest, you shall bring a sheaf. Now sheaf in old English or modern English means a handful of stalks with grain on it. But you'll see that the word sheaf is really not a good translation. The word sheaf comes from the Hebrew word omer. A lot of people refer to these days that we're counting as counting the omer. I'm rather clueless why they do that. I could see maybe counting from the omer. Again, we're looking at a, you know, it's a dry measure. About two liters, two quarts, could have been in a, uh, you know, some type of a bag, or could have been in a, you know, a ceramic uh, bowl. But this was to be brought to the priests. But again, it doesn't have anything to do with a sheaf. This is processed grain. It has been uh, allowed to grow and mature. It was cut, it was shocked, put into a teepee shape, and fully dr dried. Grain has got to be fully dry or it won't. Uh, you're going to get rot and molding and mildew. So you have, if you're storing it, you've got to get it dry. So you see these pictures are of people on the left there in a, uh, a threshing floor in a building called a winnowing barn. And I think a lot of you are aware and have been to this farm on our, that we live on. We have a winnowing barn. Large doors to the north, large doors to the south, and you got you develop a natural wind tunnel. And you'll see what they're doing. They're flailing or threshing the grain, which knocks the kernel off the stalk. Uh, the picture on the right shows where they're, uh, after they have flailed it or threshed it, they're throwing it in the air and it blows the chaff away and the grain being heavier falls down. So you can see with the wind coming from different directions, it may blow the chaff anywhere around in that 360 degrees. But if you're in a winnowing barn, you've got wind coming in one direction. So that's what's going on here. So when you come into the land, you're supposed to bring this two quarts, two liters of, in this case, barley. Now, of course, we know that barley, a kernel of barley has got potential. It can be planted and multiply itself many, 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 many times over. Uh, some people feel that this offering was finely ground. If it was finely ground, you, other than eating it, that's about all you can do with this. So this is representing something that will multiply. And could we go to the next slide? There we go. Now, it's interesting. Most people feel that this is referring to the Messiah. And this might be foreign to you. This might be new to you. As we read through this, you'll see why. We, we hear the Messiah referring to his strength is dried. How interesting. Just exactly like this grain. You have ordained me that I become the dust or like the chaff of death. It's interesting that the Messiah was beaten so badly, flailed, threshed, that his visage was so marred. And some people define this as so marred that you couldn't tell who he was. Some go to the length of saying you couldn't tell what he was that badly swollen and bloodied and disfigured. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Leviticus 23.10, when you come into the land, going back to Leviticus now, and reap the harvest, bring in an omer, about that two liter, two quart volume, dry volume, of the first fruits. Now this is a very, very distinct word. There's several words that can mean the first of the harvest. But this word reshith not only means the first, but it means the beginning. It means the best. It means the chief. It means the choice. Now, it's interesting when you take a look at what Abel offered. 
Abel did exactly the same thing. He not only offered a firstborn, but it was from what we can understand in the Hebrew, literally the first of the firstborn, just like the Messiah. But this reshif is a compound Hebrew word where the first syllable is from Rosh. You've heard of Rosh Hashanah, meaning the head of the year. This means the head, the top, the summit. So this offering that you're bringing is of great distinction, the highest distinction. It's chief, it's choice, it's the top. You wanna to go to the next slides, please. It's interesting, we see these very descriptions about the Messiah, 1 Corinthians 15. Now as Christ risen from the dead become the first fruits of those that slept. He's the chief shepherd. He's the beginning of the creation of God. So this is very interesting reinforcements that link this sacrifice, this wave offering to the Messiah. And let's go to the next slide. Now, this offering is uh, also called a wave offering. So that, whether it's a bag or whether it's a ceramic container, was going to be waved before the Lord. Now, the word wave in Hebrew is nu for nof, meaning to move to and fro, can mean curiously to besprinkle or to shed abroad. Many times it's referred to as offering up, sometimes referred to as an elevation offering. What's really interesting is this is not a unique activity at all. There are 38 references to wave offerings, 38. There's a wave offering for the consecrating of the priesthood. There's a wave offering for the trespass, heave, peace, jealousy offerings, as well as a lamb the loaves, the Nazarite vow, all of these things have this curious noof, this evidently holding up. And I know that many of us have looked at this event and it sounds like, and it's reasonable to say that, well, this must refer to Christ's resurrection. And maybe it does. But uh, bear with me, let's go to the next slide. And he shall wave that omer before the Lord. So there is a presence. The word before is panim, meaning before the face of or in the presence of. And, and I guess I would, I could ask, you know, what's the purpose of this? This is, you know, if I, if, if you brought something to say, hey, Al, take a look at this, and you're holding it in front of my face or in my easy access so I can look at and, and uh, inspect, it, it appears that might be what this is. Again, I don't mean to slam dunk conclusions, but work with me here. Let's go to the next slide. So we're waving this offering before the Lord. Is it representative of an elevation, i.e. a resurrection? Or is it representative of a evaluation or an assessment? You go to the next slide. Leviticus 23.11, he shall wave that omer before the Lord. Notice the purpose of this to be accepted for you the way the king james has got it now this word to accept another heavy duty word a very distinct word ratzon it's going to be done as a favor for you is being done as an act of goodwill towards you us a favor for us, uh, mankind, goodwill. And it's interesting that it's tied directly with acceptance. This is being done as a favor so we will become acceptable. This is done as an act of goodwill, literally laying his life down 
so that we will become acceptable. The root word for ratzon is ratzon, meaning to make acceptable, to satisfy, or to pay off. Huh. You think about the parallel here to Yom Kippur. Hmm. But it appears that this plan of salvation has its steps. We know what has happened prior to this in the life of the Messiah. He was Emmanuel. He made the step down into a human body. He gave up evidently his spirit life to the best of our understanding. And then he lived and he taught and he healed and he loved and he set the example and he suffered and he was brutalized and he died and he rose. He fulfilled everything the father asked him to do precisely. And it seems that once that was done, this was a, literally the last step that this whole package was looked at, this, all of these measures of acceptance had now been fully completed. He made us, he made mankind, or at least the first fruits, acceptable, satisfied, paid off. And this was a, like it says, a profoundly valuable, gracious, generous, free will offering and it's very interesting that there are three times in the year and what's coming up here is one of those times in the time that this was stated there are three times in the year we're to bring free will offerings which is a type of what christ did let's go to the next slide <clears throat> so he's going to wave this grain before the Lord to be accepted on our, our behalf or to make us acceptable on the morrow after the Sabbath. Now, mok or, mok or af means the day after, literally the next daylight period. The Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Most, most people accept that part, that it's going to be the morrow after, uh, and the Sabbath, of course, is debated whether this is the uh, seventh day Sabbath that falls within that seven day Feast of Unleavened Bread, or it's the high Sabbath. Either way you want to look at it, we have to, in my opinion, assume that the Messiah did, in fact, accomplish it. Because mankind is now accessible. That large veil was ripped open we have access so let's go to the next slide <clears throat> this same word ratzon is used in isaiah 49 8. it's when i began looking at this i began to realize oh this time that this wave offering was done is holy it's appointed it's to be announced it's to be embraced it's to be considered it's to be meditated on but in an acceptable time same word wrought own in that time that we became acceptable i have heard you in a day of salvation, how very interesting that word salvation is literally the Hebrew word Yeshua, meaning salvation or deliverance. In that day, I have helped you and I will guard you and give you a covenant. This word covenant is linked very much to what we're doing. We know we've got seven sevens tied with this holy event that we're going into in this count and we'll see as we look at the roots here there's some very interesting things woven into this he says you will inherit desolation this is the description of where mankind is going they're going to trash the earth but you will raise up the earth once again 
Wow. At a time. In an acceptable time or the time you became acceptable. I have helped you. Could this be a reference? to the day of the wave offering. Is that the time that the Father and Son have deemed that you're now acceptable? Don't know. We could go to the next slide. Something to think about. Psalm 89. You are a glorious source of our strength and in your favor. Oh, same word. In your favor, in your goodwill. And you're making us acceptable. Our strength shall be magnified. Boy, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly, exactly what's happening now and will continue to happen. Our strength is going to be magnified because of the, the redemption, the understanding, the purification, the adoption. You can go to the next slide. Now we're just stepping through Leviticus 23 and there are other elements to this and you will offer on that day when you wave the Omer, a male lamb. Hmm. This is really intriguing. You might also recall or be fully aware that this holy season we're counting towards has 11 loaf, two 11 loaves called first fruits different word, but they are also raised with a lamb. You will wave the Omer, a male lamb without blemish, for a complete burnt offering out of the Lord. So it's a complete consumption. And I thought it's, uh, you know, not everyone is raised sheep and goats and know how really cute they are when they're small. <laughs> They can be obnoxious when they're older, but they're really cute. And this is a, a lamb here. You can go to the next slide. It's interesting that with this wave offering, there is a meal offering with it as well of fine flour. This flour is finely ground. And it's interesting that the Messiah is called the living bread. And to have bread, you have to grind that flour. It's also mingled with oil. And of course, what does the word Messiah mean? Set apart with oil. An offering made by fire. And of course, fire is a type of refining. It's a type of trying, testing. And the Messiah went through all of those things. He became perfect through what he suffered. It's also a sweet fragrance, nikoach, meaning that it was soothing and quieting. And I thought a long time about why these offerings are referred to as a sweet smelling savor, sweet fragrance. I mean, we're human beings. Most of us really enjoy the smell of grilling, uh, whether there's chicken, fish, or uh, beef, other clean animals, it's uh, their pleasant smells. But they say that our olfactory senses are the strongest stimulant to memory. It's the strongest association that we have. And it's interesting, that smell of those offerings are associated with the redemption, with the acceptance of mankind. Very strong, significant part. We've often said that these holy times represent the plan of salvation. And this is right there. There's also a drink offering of wine. And of course, we know that it became a symbol of his blood and he poured out his life. He literally lost that blood. So it's an interesting association. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 6, 2, 4, he said, I have heard you in a time accepted. He's quoting in the day of salvation 
Well, he's quoting Isaiah. In this day of salvation, I helped you. But look at this. They're adding on. Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Now is the actual fulfillment of this because he lived, he healed, he fulfilled myriads of prophecies. He died brutally and was raised. And this completed the, the whole concept. And it is now the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time that you, we, us have become acceptable. And it just struck me that they're making this point here. They're looking at a particular time in the year that we're to consider, whoa, this is the culmination of this. And the, and the Greek word is very, really very simple or similar. It's accepted or acceptable. And uh, its origin is very similar to to receive or grant, grant access to. We can go to the next slide. And we've just stepped through those verses about the wave offering. And it's a great deal about our acceptance, our acceptance so that we can go forward, so that we do have a future. But what's really interesting is right on the heels of these words about the wave offering, we have, you can go to the next verse. Leviticus 23, 15, we're just stepping through this. And you shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath, the time that that wave offering was done, from the day that you brought the omer of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, in this particular case, the way it's described in Leviticus 23, is there are seven Sabbaths. You can see the origin of the word is Shabbat, and its origin is Shabbat, meaning to cease or rest. So there were seven of these be complete. And even after the morrow, after the seven. So this seems to pretty clearly link it to seven Sabbaths. Uh, now, if you go down the next verse, I'm sorry, the next uh, slide. Let's take a look at this. There's, I was mentioning, there's some intriguing things woven into this about a covenant. So the word seven here and seventh, verse 15 has seven, verse 16 has got the word seventh. The word seven comes from Sheba. You know this word. You know of a queen. You know of Bathsheba. You know of Beersheba. And of course, that word can mean seven. The word for seventh, you know, the a different tense of it is Shebei or something like that, meaning seventh. But it's interesting, both of these words come from the origin of Shaba, meaning to swear or take an oath. <clears throat> hmm. Do you think the people that were reading this were aware of the root word. I'm sure they were. I'm sure they were. And it's interesting that this holy season, we're trying to figure out what are we, why are we doing this? It helps a lot to understand what the, what's preceded it. And what, what are these sevens about? So there's this underlying theme of taking an oath or making a covenant. You can go to the next slide. Now in Exodus 34, 22, Deuteronomy 16 and 2 Chronicles, we see the feast of weeks is the way it's translated commonly. The word for feast is Chag. It's one of the three holy times, elevated times in the year that we're coming into. I find it very interesting, and I find it to be unfortunate that this event coming up is rarely called a feast. It's referred to as 50 days or sevens, Pentecost or Shavuot. 
I think we're doing a disservice and I think we're missing the significance and the weight of this event. So we have a Hag coming up, a festival gathering. And it's the word for weeks is the Hebrew word Shabua, meaning a period of seven. A period of seven, a little bit different variation on what we looked at. But you know, the root word is the same as Shabbat. So we have a feast that could be about sevens, and in fact it is, seven sevens, but it's also linked strongly to an oath or a covenant. This is kind of the focus from what I can tell. It's not all about sevens and it's not all about 50. That is not the focus. Let's go to the next slide. Hmm. So here we are, counting, counting off 50 days. And you probably saw the, um, in the advertisement or the promotion for this study, a mountain scene with a very winding road going up and down it. That's an actual, that's an actual mountain scene. That's an actual picture. That's not a, mount, a, a artist rendition. So here we are counting upward. We're counting upward. And you think about these 50 days, you've got an extraordinary number of events that happen during these 50 days. Just to rehearse very quickly what the Israelites saw. They, on leaving the, the sea, and the supernatural collapse and destruction of the Egyptian army. They walked out three days and went to a bitter spring. And it's interesting. Moses was told, throw a branch in from a particular tree. Huh, who's called the branch? They had the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire appear to them during those 50 days. There was actually times and the cloud would radiate and referred to the glory in the cloud. They had manna provided for them and quail provided for them. Moses struck the rock and opened up water flows, the living water. Moses held the rod high and it's interesting. It's so interesting that we have a branch being thrown in and turning the water sweet to living edible waters. And we've got all of the plagues on Egypt being performed and involved with a staff. Really very much the same thing, a branch. So here's Moses with Aaron and her holding up this same rod, symbolic of the Messiah, and they won the battle. It's interesting in 1 Peter 3, 17 through 20, it talks about, it kind of rehearses, as you know, in a lot of the epistles, they're rehearsing the role the Messiah has played, the scriptures that he's fulfilled, the prophecies. And it talked about his death, and his resurrection, 1 Peter 3, 17 through 20, I'll just make a reference to it. But he said, in that state, i.e. that risen state, he went back and spoke to the demons, spirits, that were imprisoned at the time of Noah. Hmm. And it's interesting what he might have talked to them about. It's an opinion. We know that they overstepped their bounds. Presumably they knew what their bounds were, and they knew what the consequences were. But they got restrained. Some people feel that they may have been trying to alter the genetics and hence ruin the genetic line of the Messiah and foil God's plan. But now here he's coming to them after this. He became flesh. He lived, he died, he rose, and he's coming back to him and said, guys, game over, too late to corrupt my line. 
too late to do this. I just thought it was really interesting. Right on the heels of his death, he, they were told to go to the mountain. They had been told to go to a particular mountain. Luke 24 talks about that he gave them understanding so they could begin to process this. Again, right after his death, began remembering, recalling things and putting the pieces together. He told them to stay in the city. Now you think about it, that's a pretty hot spot. That was a dangerous place to be. When they went to the sea, they went a good hundred miles away, way. A good hundred miles north of there when they were at the sea or this mountain that they were talking about. But stay in the city until the Father gives you this power. You'll recall also during those 50 days, they went fishing. Some people feel, well, they were really lacking faith. Maybe so. Then again, they may not have been independently wealthy and needed to do this. They may have needed the income. We don't know. But we know the story well. No fish at all overnight. And then oh, throw your nets out on the right side, which anybody that's fished all night would not be in a good humor, I'm sure. It's interesting. Within those 50 days, you've got Christ talking to Peter. Now, Peter, do you agape me? Are you truly, deeply convicted and affectionate towards me? And he responded, well, you know, I'm your friend. And he repeated this multiple times, but every time he did, it was to feed and nurture. There's actually two words for love there and two different words to feed there. Interesting. John 21 talks about a great many other things that he taught them and that they observed that curiously weren't written down. Is this possibly the reason why the miracle of speaking and hearing were given? So that all of these massive prophecies that they had witnessed and these profound truths that had been given to them could be precisely conveyed to the thousands of people that had come. From up to several thousand miles away, people had come to this event. And it's interesting on the 40th day, the 40th day, this will be, and according to our calculation, next Thursday. If you always start on a Sunday, you'll always have the 40th day on a Thursday. Think about the significance of the 40th day. There were nearly 500 people that saw the Messiah while he was alive. But think about the significance of what happened on the 40th day. There isn't a Christian group, a Bible-believing group around that is not familiar with the commission. And of course, that commission was given on the 40th day. Look at the words that Christ said on that 40th day, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He made this statement on the 40th day. You're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He also told them to go and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, every human, presumably, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. It also goes on to talk about that he was to teach them or to convey that there is repentance and remission of sin. His, his closing words, his closing words Multiple places this is recorded, but the account in Luke, I am with you always. This is actually a blend, what I've been reading to you out of Matthew 28, Luke, uh, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 21, and Acts 1. I am with you always. This is exactly what they needed to hear, and this is what we need to remember even to the end of the world. 
listen, listen to this. This is recorded in Luke. And he lifted up his hands. And as he was blessing them, he was carried up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Isn't it interesting that as the guys were looking, their mouth wide open, two angelic beings said, well, why are you looking up in the sky for? And I'm sure they were speechless. We just saw this phenomenal thing. But he said, he's going to return in like manner. Think about this. Is it possible that the Messiah will return, calling you by name? with his arms extended once again, in an embrace and in a welcome. His closing final words were, follow me. And that's where we're at. That's where we're going, we're following. And I will, uh, I will mute myself and listen to any additions, subtractions or uh, corrections here. But that's um, that's what I had to give tonight. Okay, well, we're at the point where we do the question and answer. Any questions, comments, suggestions? Ann. Yes, Hal, I want to go back to a couple of statements that you made that had a lot more wisdom than maybe you may realize. Very early in your presentation, I tend to keep track of time, 7.42 p.m. Central Standard Time, you made a statement that is so easy to uh, pass over, no pun intended. You said you wanted to dwell on what is not debatable and that is, such a, that is such a mature statement because, as you know, some people are starting the count from different days, and so they will end up on different days, observing Pentecost on different days. And it would be so easy for a discussion to degenerate into an argument with all three sides attempting to prove their point. But your statement about dwelling on what is not debatable and keeping us focused on the trunk of the tree, really, again, is a statement that can so easily be overlooked, but I wanted to mention it because it really does show maturity in making sure that the discussion we have is profitable. I am done. As always, Stan, you're very kind. I, I appreciate that. I just find so many times uh, there, there are those potential different answers and explanations but i also find this phenomenally encouraging statements that are here that are sure that are definite these things have happened they're underway and whether we understand all of the minutiae or not is really irrelevant because he's got it covered but thank you stan robin um, thank you, Hal. This was a very good um, and very timely message. I appreciated the um, the idea that you that you brought out that this is an important time that can sometimes be overlooked a little bit. And um, I think the significance for Pentecost is maybe far greater than any of us really know. Um, I wanted to go back to a couple of things that were early on in your presentation um, when you were talking about the she for the Omer. My, I've got two statements I want to make. Um, and the first one is, is it possible or did I once hear that when they would beat down a, a sheaf, which would be that bundle, that that would result in about an Omer of, of grain? Is that is that possible? Have I did I hear that somewhere, or have I made that up in my head? Oh, that that's interesting. I guess it depends. Again, the sheave is uh, bringing in the sheaves. We've heard of that expression, uh, and I guess it depends on 
how big of an armful you've got. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, right. Well, uh, I think also a lot of our grains have been bred to be uber producers rather than standard uh, ancient grains. Maybe yeah. they didn't have quite as much per stock. Anyway, right. that, that was just, that was, uh, you were, you were referencing that sheaf was in English, but in Omer, it was about two quarts or two liters. Right. And um, that just sparked in me that I thought that I had heard that those are actually about equivalent. Yeah, that, that, that could be, I don't know what the yield would be. Um, and like you say, it's going to depend on the, I don't know sure. that there's a great deal of yield difference between barley and wheat and oats. I don't know. Those are good questions. Um, my other comment, um, you were talking about when they were winnowing out the, the grain that it required wind. And I mean, I knew that, but I just had more of a, 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 a insight that the wind being the Holy Spirit, that that is what's going to be the separator between the the grain and the chaff. So I just, that was, that was a point that just was impressed on me while you were speaking. I wanted to share it. Uh, that's a good addition. That, that is really interesting that there, this is how the separation happens and with and without the spirit. Hmm. Oh yeah. Thanks for your comment, Robin. Crystal's iPad. So why why was the Holy Spirit given? There there's a verse that clearly says why it was given. It's to bring all things that I said into remembrance. All things that I've commanded. It's not an arbitrary so I can memorize the 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 uh, Torah better or whatever. It's to bring his words into remembrance. And I'll look up the scripture where, where it actually says that. But again, it, it it was the words of the of the man that had wisdom greater than Solomon. Words that, that nobody had ever heard before. It was the words that that, that he spoke that actually sh that revealed the Father. Nobody had ever known the Father before then. He was revealing the Father. All of those words. I, we call them the red letters, but the, all of his actions and his deeds and his functions, when he did it, like you're saying, Hal, on the timing and all the symbolism that was involved with, with what he actually pulled off and what he actually functionally did. It's amazing. And it, that's to bring the Holy Spirit is to bring all of that to our remembering or to our memories so that we can get it right because we can't get it right without getting looking at the good example. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Phil. That's uh, you know, I don't I, I know the scripture you're talking about. I remember uh, <laughs> every time we had a a test at Ambassador, we would always pray that all things would be brought to remembrance. I remember that being often brought up, but. Yeah, that's a it's it's a good point. It's a good point. Thanks. Igor. Uh, thank you very much, Hal, for the presentation. Uh, different Hebrew words that you gave additional insight into the familiar verses. I have a couple of questions. The first one is more conceptual. When the wave sheaf offering was done, it is alluded to Jesus Christ. And uh, you also mentioned we are also accepted. Uh, is it acceptance of Christ and his sacrifice that is paving way for our acceptance? Or how is that? related like his acceptance versus our acceptance that's that's my understanding and of course it's 
it's it's my opinion, but it, it seems that there was, of course, a series of events that had to happen from Emmanuel through him becoming the wave offering. All of those steps had to be done to fulfill and by by him so perfectly and excellently fulfilling the will of the father these were all contingencies it seems that it like a lot of the sacrifices have multiple levels or layers to them all of which has to be done uh well it's you take a look at the passover it was not only the death of the lamb but it was also the death of the firstborn both things were necessary for the Israelites to be protected and then to be liberated, uh, very much like uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. There is the uh, there is the sin offering and there is the atoning offering, and there are these pieces. But as you as you mentioned, Tagore, it's it's my understanding that all of these contingencies had to be fulfilled by the Messiah perfectly for this his offering his obedience to be uh, approved accepted inspected and then for us to be granted that favor of acceptance as well it's again that's my philosophy but that seems to make sense to my little immature mind thank you uh uh hall uh, if I understand correctly, those who are in him, those would automatically be benefited. Uh, those would be also be accepted. Am I saying, oh, stating it correct? Yeah, yeah. And he says, look, if, if you do this, if you're in him, if you've accepted, if you are yielded to, if you're uh, convicted, you will never die, i.e. you will never die permanently i.e. you're accepted you're accepted towards perpetual life again my thoughts sure uh, the scriptures also go along with that like those who are believing in him according to scriptures those who are following him in truth uh, that's the uh, first question if i uh, may i ask second question uh, this is a bit controversial. Uh, the words that you already visited, visited. So just want to share the screen and show that verse. This is uh, Leviticus 23, verse 11. And here in King James, we see, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So the Sabbath, the morrow or the day after the Sabbath, uh, this Sabbath, uh, worldwide COGs, most of them understand it as a weekly Sabbath. and uh, But the Septuagint has a different take. For example, this is English translation of Septuagint, LXC. And he shall lift the sheaf before the Lord and to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the first day, the priest shall lift it up. In this context, the first day refers to first day of the unleavened bread. So it's always the second day of unleavened bread. It has to be. I checked the Greek. This also pretty much stays uh, the protas, that is first. So does Hebrew, or according to your understanding, this word Sabbath uh, has any credible evidence that it refers to weekly Sabbath instead of uh, the first day of unleavened bread? Well, you, you point out something that I think we're all aware that there is a debate whether it is a weekly Sabbath or the annual. Um, a couple of things to look at in the New Testament, you will see that uh, first day in the week, first day of the week is I think there's three or four, maybe five times that that is referred to. And it's either Mia Sabaton or Proto Sabaton. 
as to when this is done. And that to me would indicate that it's the first day of the count, not the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's again, Hal's opinion. So first day of the trumpet, as you are blowing trumpets on every day, is that what you mean? Well, no, I, I'm talking about, uh, it, it refers to, you know, the day that the Messiah rose as the, uh, well, again, this is debatable too, but it refers to the first day of the week, early in the morning, near dawn, the disciples came on what's called the first day of the week, but that is probably Mia Sabaton in Greek, meaning the first of, and of course, Sabaton to us, we're thinking, oh, that can't mean the keeping of a Sabbath, but in my opinion, what they're referring to is it's the first of the Moad. It's the first day of the 50-day Moad that when this happened, which would make perfect sense. It's, a, it's also intriguing as you look at this, uh, we know that the Messiah was raised on the third day. And again, this is a, one of those controversial topics as to when he actually rose. We know that he did, but it refers to when they came as Mia, or in some cases there's proto sabaton One proto I think means first in succession or Mia means first of the first day of the Sabbaton or the Moad, the 50 day Moad is my opinion, what's what's going on there. So uh, yeah, that's again, my, Hal's opinion, it seems to work. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Alan? Hey Hal, thanks again for uh... All the work you put into this. I'm going to take us over to Acts chapter 10. And, uh, this is the situation with uh, Peter explaining to the, uh, the centurion and his family what happened when he saw the vision and came. It was appointed to him to come to this man and to bring the gospel to him. And this is uh, Acts 10, 35. It says this. Uh, let me begin with 34. And Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. This uh, Italian man. But in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness. There's two things there. But if those two things are in place, which this, this man was apparently devout, feared the Lord and worked righteousness. And the apostles sent to him because this was not an ordinary man, but it was a man who genuinely and sincerely feared him and worked righteousness. In verse 35, he is accepted with him. And as you read down the chapter, it goes into that his family was baptized, which we can interpret that to mean accepted. His family came into the same covenant and came into the same acceptance that the, uh, the man did. So this idea of acceptance is spread through, uh, throughout scripture. In the introduction, that we see in Ephesians chapter one. You know how in Ephesians you have this very flowery language and how Paul likes to introduce his letters with uh, great introductory remarks. And he says in verse six here, Ephesians one six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, his graciousness, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that glorious language? Isn't that wonderful language? He has made us accepted in the beloved. And so it is then uh, his work 
and then we are to follow it up with the increase of our faith, remaining uh, and abiding in the faith in him and working righteousness and the proper fear of the Lord, which makes us all accepted, which is such a big topic because I have found in my life, as I scan the the horizon of all the people in the churches of God that I've known through the years, almost none of them have an expression of acceptance on their lips. Almost none of them are forthright in saying, I'm so glad that I am accepted by his grace, which is what it says here in Ephesians 1, 6. But instead, it seemed to be more of a, a, a culture of, I don't know, and nobody really knows, which is a downer, a big negative. They knew, first century church knew, the apostles knew, you're supposed to know. And uh, I think we're, we should have expressions of, we know we have passed from death to life, as it says in 1 John. We should know that and be assured of it and encourage one another along those lines. Acceptance is very important. It's important with peers and friends. It's important with coworkers, family, but above all, <laughs> Far above all, it is, it is important for us to understand our acceptance with God himself, with our Savior. Thanks again, Hal. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Al. That, that is definitely a reinforcement. And you think about the areas where we struggle most are the things that Satan embodies. He has been rejected. His behavior has been rejected, at least to the best of our understanding. And he works that angle with us all the time. I want to just expand just a little bit. When you consider this wave offering, to me, is all about the, the raising of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, not his ascent. The ascent happened on the 40th day. It seems to be a separate thing. But the churches of God have surprisingly ignored that eternity changing event. You know the scriptures well that if he doesn't rise, you're not rising either. You're going to still be in your, your sins. You're as good as you're dead. So it's a massively significant step and, and a celebratory time in the plan of salvation that has largely been ignored and I'm going to try to keep my foot out of it, but because there are differences of opinion, you know, when he arose, and of course, with all of the counterfeiting of anything happening on Sunday, the churches of God have given it a, a good push and don't embrace the, the confidence and the encouragement of the statement of acceptance that when he rose, you're going to rise with him, my father and your father. So thanks, Al.